All right, there we go. Hello, good evening, everybody. Welcome. My name is Brittany White. I'm the coordinator of evangelization and discipleship for Nativity, and I want to welcome you all um, and those of us joining on the live stream to our night with the exorcist. Um, I have the privilege to introduce you to Father Vincent Lampert. He is a 1985 graduate of St. Meinrad College, a 1991 graduate of the University of St. Mary of the Lake in Mundelein, Illinois. He was ordained a priest for the Archdiocese on June 1st in 1991, and he currently serves as the pastor of St. Michael and St. Peter in Brookville, Indiana. In 2005, he was appointed the exorcist for the Archdiocese. So if you could all help me, welcome Father Vincent. Good evening, everyone. Let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death, amen. Loving God, we ask your blessing upon all of us as we gather here this evening. May this time to come together to talk about the topic of exorcism lead all of us to know the important role that you must play in our lives. Bless all of us, our family members and friends, and we lift up in our thoughts and prayers all those who are sick and suffering in any way. As in all things, we make this prayer in the name of Jesus, who is Lord forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. It's good to see everybody. Anybody creeped out about tonight's topic? Perhaps maybe just a little bit. So much information, I can get off track so easily. So I'm gonna throw out a bunch of information and then there'll be time for you to ask questions. And I love questions because it lets me know exactly what it is that you would like to know. So I wanna begin this evening just talking a little bit about the nature of the devil himself. Belief in the existence and activity of angels and demons is a common religious fact within many different cultural traditions. At the same time, there are many people who reject the notion of angelic creatures and believe that the existence of angels and demons, along with the lights of exorcism and demon possession, come out of a primitive superstitious worldview as a relic from the time of Christ or a throwback to the Middle Ages. For some people, to even talk about the topic is an embarrassment. For these people, evil is something of our own making. They believe that evil is nothing more than humanity's inhumane treatment of one another. The rejection of the existence of angels and demons does not make them any less real or imaginary. In fact, the negation of the angelic world is not a trait of the modern world. With the Pharisees and the majority of the Jewish people of his day, our Lord shared a conviction concerning the existence of angels and demons, whereas the Sadducees rejected the belief in the existence of such things. In Catholic tradition, it's always biblical revelation and the magisterium of the church that consistently reaffirms the truth of the existence of angels and demons. The Catechism of the Catholic Church states that God, our Creator, created all things visible and invisible, the corporeal and the spiritual, by means of his own omnipotent power. At once, from the beginning of time, created each creature angelic and mundane. Just think for a moment, every Sunday when we come to Mass and we recite the Creed, what do we say? God is the Creator of all things, visible and invisible. And in those words, we are acknowledging that we believe in the existence of spiritual realities, namely angels and demons. When it comes to the existence of demons, it was Pope Paul VI back in 1972 who stated clearly that evil is not merely the lack of something, but an effective agent, a living spiritual being. He went on to say that it is contrary to the teaching of the Bible and of the church to refuse to recognize the existence of such a reality or to try to explain it away 
as a pseudo-reality, a conceptual and fanciful, fanciful personification of the unknown causes of our misfortunes. Now, the Bible does not clearly tell us when the angelic world was created. St. Augustine, proceeding very cautiously, believed that it could be seen in the very first words in the book of Genesis. It talks about this light that shoots out from the very beginning of creation without any material support. He said that the light that was first made was the formation of the spiritual creation. He defined this spiritual light as nothing other than intellectual life turned entirely toward God who illumines it. These angels know themselves in their own nature and then refer themselves back to God, and in doing so, they complete their own formation. However, not all angelic creatures chose to complete their formation. Rather than turning to God, some chose to turn away. So in the Genesis account, we are told God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw how good the light was. God then separated the light from the darkness. And it's interesting to note that when light was created, it was good, but when it was separated, it does not say that it was good. Some of the fathers of the church see this as the fall of the angels who chose to use their free will in a manner to turn away from God rather than as an opportunity to draw closer to him. So angels are purely intellectual creatures that received infused knowledge from the very first moment they were created. So angels don't have to learn anything. You could say that they were just downloaded with information and they can immediately call it up. That's why one of the signs of demon possession is the ability to speak and understand languages otherwise unknown to the individual. An angel would not have to go to school to study a language. It would just know it because of that infused knowledge. St. Augustine distinguishes between what he calls morning and evening knowledge. Evening knowledge is the things that angels know according to the natural order. And then when God created the angels and gave them all this knowledge, he basically said, with the knowledge that I have given to you, will you now choose to glorify me? And then we know that Lucifer, along with one-third of the angelic choir, chose to not accept God, but rejected him. And in their rejection of God, they fell, and they became imperfect creatures, if you will. Because he goes on to say that morning knowledge is the knowledge of accepting things according to the divine order. It's a heavy topic. But just think of the story of creation. It was always evening came and morning followed, and then it was the new day. So God created the angels, gave them infused knowledge, and then said, with the knowledge I have given you, will you now honor and glorify me? And those who said yes, completed their formation, their creation, and they're now part of the heavenly choir. Lucifer, along with one-third, said no, and they fell. Now, the rite of exorcism states clearly, in the whole history of salvation, there are angelic creatures. A part of them serve the divine plan, always giving hidden and potent aid to the church. Another part has fallen and is called diabolic. They oppose the salvific will of God and the redemptive work of Christ and try to associate humans with their rebellion against God. Misery loves company. And so the devil would want to try to trip us up so that we make the same poor choice that he himself has made, and rather than enjoying the beatific vision in heaven, we would receive eternal damnation. St. Thomas Aquinas maintains that the first of the sinful angels was before the fall the most exalted of all the angels. After the fall, he became the chief of the evil spirits, now referred to as the devil or Satan. The word devil comes from the Greek word diabolos, which means adversary, slanderer, accuser. It occurs 33 times in the New Testament. The word Satan comes from the Hebrew and means accuser. 
It occurs 34 times in the New Testament. Another term, when people talk about the devil, we use the name Lucifer. And the name Lucifer means light. Think of the word loose, light. So Lucifer, before the fall, was closest to the throne of God. Therefore, he would illuminate the glory of God more than any other of God's angelic creatures. Because the more that you're close to the source of the light, the more that you will radiate the light. But then Lucifer chose to reject God, and in doing so, he's no longer illuminated by the glory of God, which is why we always associate him with darkness. So Satan is a morally wicked creature, hostile to both humans and to God. He's not wicked by nature because everything that God created is good in its nature, but all of us can use our free will in such a way that we go against the nature that God has given to us. So this wicked creature is also named by his maleficent activity. He's branded as the evil one. In the final plea in the Lord's Prayer, we ask to be delivered from evil and the evil one. He's also called the enemy, the adversary, the one who sows weeds in the field. As the enemy, he is the antichrist par excellence. Depending on the form his malice takes, he is described as a liar and the father of lies. And it's a murderer from the beginning, since his lying led humanity into sin and death. What was his lie to Eve in the garden? Surely you will not die. You will become like gods. Inasmuch as he draws humans into evil, he is the tempter or the seducer. Satan is also referred to as the enormous dragon or the ancient serpent. The case with Lucifer's sin was that he loved his own good without considering the fact that God was calling him to something more. Again, Lucifer was the most brilliant and most beautiful of all created beings in heaven. Prior to his rebellion, Lucifer is described in these following terms as found in the book of the prophet Ezekiel. In chapter 28, verses 12 through 17, it says of Lucifer, you have the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were the anointed cherub who covers, and I placed you there. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked in the midst of the stones of fire. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom by reason of your splendor. So Lucifer, again, like all angels, was created for the purpose of glorifying God. However, instead of serving God and praising God forever, he desired to rule over heaven and over all creation in place of God. So Lucifer wanted supreme authority. In Isaiah 14, Lucifer says, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation. I will ascend the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. And what word do we see in all those sentences? I, I, I. So Lucifer's focus was on himself, which is why we say that his sin was the sin of pride. St. Augustine writes that pride is the disordered love of my own excellence to the point of contempt for God. St. Thomas Aquinas explains that it is impossible for a creature to cease being a creature so as to become equal to the Creator in all respects. Satan, therefore, wanted to be like God, not by nature and as an equal, but by resemblance. He wanted to be similar to God inasmuch as God is, by nature, an end unto himself. Therefore, in the words of St. Thomas, uh, John of St. Thomas, Lucifer used his free will, choosing to remain first in an inferior order rather than becoming one among others in the superior order. And Satan's sin involves the sin of many angels. The book of Revelation declares 
that the dragon's tail swept one-third of the stars out of the sky and cast them to the earth. Angels in a higher choir, again, illumined those in the lower choirs. And when Lucifer chose to rebel against God, his choice reverberated through all nine choirs of angels. And when it reverberated through all nine choirs, one-third of all the angels chose to follow Lucifer. So we can say that his bad example influenced one-third of the angelic choir who then submit to Satan as their chief. St. Thomas Aquinas says these fallen angels become demons and the slaves of the one to whom they have surrendered, namely Satan. The fathers of the church forcefully assert that the wickedness of the devil and his demons, far from being natural and innate, which would make God responsible for evil, results from a personal decision to sin. So after the fall, these demons do not lose their angelic intellectual quality, that evening knowledge, they still retain that, but their not minds now become darkened, deprived of the light of wisdom. You know, I grew up on the west side of Indianapolis in the old Holy Trinity Parish. I went to Cardinal Ritter High School. I have eight brothers and sisters. My brothers and I, when we were kids, used to get these little rubber balls that would glow in the dark. Do you remember those? You put them up to the light bulb, and then you turn off the lamp, and what would happen? It would glow. But the light wasn't coming from the ball. It was something that it absorbed. And so Lucifer, you could say, is like that ball, closest to the glory of God. But what happens to the ball if it isn't constantly nourished by the light? Eventually it fades and goes out. Again, Lucifer rejected God, no longer illumined by God, and then is now in total darkness. Think of angels or think of saints. When you see their pictures, what's always around their head, it's a halo. They're not radiating their glory. They're radiating the glory of God. So much did they unite their will with the will of God that they are now radiating the glory of God in their own lives, something that each and every one of us is called to do as well. Now, the free will of the demons stubbornly persists forever in evil. Sometimes people will ask the question, is it possible for the devil and his demons to repent? And the answer is no. They are incapable of repenting, and their damnation is eternal. For demons, no redemption is possible. And why is this the case? It is because God no longer offers them the grace that could help convert them. God respects their nature. Angels do not grow in understanding. From the very first moment they were created, they were in the presence of all that they could know. It's not like for us where we can wake up one day, we can have a conversion experience, be like St. Paul on the road to Damascus. That would, that's not within angelic nature. They are in the presence of everything that they can know. Lucifer knew that one of the consequences of his choice to rebel against God was eternal damnation. And even aware of that possible consequence, he still chose to rebel against God. Now, the world that Jesus Christ came to redeem is saturated with demonic presence. Scripture gives many accounts about the reality of the devil and his baneful influence on humans. The good news is that the church holds to the belief of the victory of Christ over the devil and demons, but also the struggle that continues over the course of human history. This struggle manifests itself in varied ways that includes the affliction of people, things, and places. Jesus' entire mission is described as a reconquest, an enterprise to free humanity from our servitude to Satan and to restore all of us to a rightful relationship with God. We are told in Luke's Gospel that Jesus came to proclaim release to the captives, to set free all those who are oppressed. Jesus' mission, I would say, is one of exorcism. 
It is a battle against unclean spirits that disfigure the image of God. As the Acts of the Apostle tells us, he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. However, our victory over the devil and his demons is not one without combat. Satan stubbornly insists on preventing the coming of the kingdom of God. Satan tries in the desert from the very beginning of Jesus' public ministry to divert him from his mission. Peter will do the same later, and for that reason, Jesus says to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. Satan is the one who puts into the heart of Judas the plan to betray Jesus and even enters into him. And after tempting Jesus in the desert, Satan, we are told, departed from him until an opportune time. Satan believes that the crucifixion is now his hour, but it is the hour of Christ. Jesus cries out from the cross, Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me, yet not my will, but your will be done. In contrast to Adam, Jesus resists Satan with his unfailing obedience to the will of the Father. It can be said that the whole life and suffering of Jesus are a yes to God and consequently a no to Satan. Satan's perceived moment of his victory becomes the moment of his defeat. It's why in an exorcism, the priest will hold up a crucifix in the face of the demon that's now manifesting in the body of someone and the priest basically is saying, you have been defeated before, you will be defeated again, so why do you resist? Again, Jesus is dying on the cross. Satan believes that he has won, but then he comes to realize that this is his defeat. He comes to understand that everything that he was doing that he thought would lead humanity into eternal damnation was actually playing into God's hands. And that infuriates him, and then he begins his attack on all of us. And that's the ministry that I was called to back in 2005 by Archbishop Daniel Beekline. People ask me, how did you get the job? And I tell them I was in the wrong place at the wrong time. The Archdiocese of Indianapolis has always had a stably appointed exorcist. So even when exorcism fell out of practice after the Second Vatican Council, the Archdiocese of Indianapolis always had a priest appointed to the ministry. The priest before me was Monsignor John Ryan, who was pastor of St. Anthony Parish on the west side of Indianapolis. Ironically, I attended grade school there when it was all saints school, never realized that one day I was going to inherit one of Monsignor's job. But when he died in July of 2005, Archbishop Beekline began looking for a replacement. All the priests were trying to stay under the radar. <laughs> I was at the Archbishop's house one afternoon for a meeting, and the Archbishop said, I know you're planning to be on sabbatical early next year. I have something else for you to study. I'm appointing you to be the exorcist for the archdiocese. Now let's go to our meeting. And I don't remember anything that happened after that. <laughs> so in February of 2006, I arrived in Rome, and I was able to um, connect with a Franciscan priest who allowed me then to mentor under him. And during the three months that I lived in Rome, I learned firsthand the church's ministry to those who were up against the forces of evil and who were seeking the help of the church. So the three months I was there, I set in on 40 exorcisms that Father Carmony allowed me to participate in, and in doing so, again, uh, learned the ministry. When I was appointed back in 2005, I became one of only 12 stably appointed exorcists in the United States. So there really was no one to train under here. The rite itself says that the best way to learn is through the apprenticeship model to learn under a seasoned exorcist. So the exorcist who trained me was trained by Father Candido Amentini. He's really the passionist priest who brought exorcism back into modernity, if you will. He's also the one that trained Father Gabriel Amorth, 
who was the former chief exorcist in Rome, who died in 2016. Since being appointed the exorcist and receiving training, uh, I've also attended the Vatican course on exorcism. I'm a member of the International Association of Exorcists, which is a group of 700 priests and their helpers from throughout the world who gather in Rome every other year for ongoing uh, training and formation, and also as an opportunity to network with one another. Many exorcists are not publicly known. There are now 125 stably appointed exorcists in the United States. Those of us who are publicly known receive a high volume of calls and emails. I currently get about 2,000 calls and email, emails every year. Currently, during COVID, I'm now getting 10 to 12 calls a day from people literally all over the world who are asking for the help of the church. Not all exorcists have to belong to the International Association, but again, by being a member, I'm able to network with other priests from all over the world. And if somebody contacts me from a, another country, then I'm able to try to connect them with a priest in their area. So I like to be publicly known because I like to talk about the topic. I like to educate people about this ministry because I think the more that it's shrouded in secrecy, the more credit that we're giving to the devil. And any time that we can drag him out into the light, the light of Christ, we come to discover that the devil truly is nothing to fear. But it does seem today that the devil is having the upper hand in the lives of many people. I always say that belief in God will lead us in one direction and the lack of faith will lead us in another. And there are many people today who no longer believe in God. I read a stat recently that said that 79% of Catholics between the ages of 18 and 35 no longer believe in God and no longer practice their faith. 79% of that age bracket. And when I hear that number, I hear those words again in the book of Genesis where Satan is saying to Eve, surely you will not die, you will become like gods. In other words, we're trying to replace God with ourselves. That's what Satan himself tried to do, and look what happened to him. The good news is that the human person were able to grow in holiness and virtue in wisdom and understanding, and if we make a poor choice, we can get our lives back on the right path. And really, my role as an exorcist is to help people who have put their lives on a bad path to try to find the way back to God again. I always say that an exorcist is not focused on what the devil is doing, but it really wants to help people to focus on what God wants to do in their lives. Even when people do something that creates an entry point to evil, God is always there wanting us to make a return to him. Think of the prodigal son. Again, God always wants us to return, but God respects our free will. He certainly wants us to unite our will with his will. We say that in the Lord's Prayer, don't we? Not my will, but your will be done. But even though people say those words, the question is, do we truly mean them? The church recognizes four different types of extraordinary demonic activity, and they are demonic infestation, the presence of evil in a location with an object or even in an animal. Think of the story of the Gerasene demoniac when the demons asked to be sent into the swine. So again, evil can be present in a location, in an object, something that perhaps was cursed, but also could be in an animal. The church also recognizes demonic vexation, which are physical attacks. Somebody believes they're being attacked by a demon that's leaving marks or bruises, sometimes incisions of letters that will appear on a person's body, protrude out for a period of time, and then recede in. There can be demonic obsession, which are mental attacks. So the devil is literally trying to get into our heads so that everything that we think is filtered through the presence of the devil or some other evil spirit. 
And then there is demonic possession, whereby the devil or some evil spirit will take control of our body, treating our body as if it were its own. So using the person's mouth to speak, their eyes to see, their hands to give gestures, their legs and feet to walk or run. Whenever a demon manifests through possession, one must always make the distinction between the person as an individual created in the image and likeness of God and the demon who is now using that person's body as if it were its own. Why would the devil be interested in possessing a human body? And the answer is at the core of our Christian belief. What's the greatest thing that God ever did for us? The incarnation. God took on human form in the person of Jesus Christ. The devil in his twisted sense who wants to resemble God believes that he takes on human form by possessing a human body. The exorcist in many ways is trained to be a skeptic, so the rite itself says that I need to reach moral certitude, meaning believing beyond a doubt that what I'm dealing with is extraordinary demonic activity. So the Vatican has put out an intake questionnaire, so I would sit down with somebody, go through this questionnaire, such as, have you ever been diagnosed with a mental illness? Have you been prescribed medication? Are you taking your medication? If not, did you stop taking it at the direction of your doctor? You know, what type of music do you listen to? Have you ever been involved in any satanic rituals or practices, new age or the occult, uh, any addictions or drugs, that type of thing? So there is an intake questionnaire. There's also a protocol used here in the United States. So I would require the person to have some type of mental evaluation by a psychiatrist, a physical examination by a medical doctor. Another part would be for the person to want to resume their spiritual life or to be brought into a relationship with Christ for the very first time. More than half the people I deal with are not Catholic. They come from other Christian faith traditions or even other world religions. One of, one of the things I see today with the growing trend of the lack of faith is that oftentimes people believe that I have special powers and abilities. And I always say that if we're relying on me, we're all in trouble. But if we're relying on the power and the authority of Jesus Christ that he has given to his church and to his ministers, that's the right focus. But there's a lot of people today, when they call me, they've self-diagnosed, and they believe that the priest is a magician or a wizard who can use his bag of tricks to make the devil go away so that they can go on their merry way. But again, Jesus is not a bystander in an exorcism. He is the main actor. So people have to want, desire, or to be open to having a relationship with Christ. So resuming the spiritual life is so important. I would look for four signs of demonic presence that the church identifies, the ability to speak and understand languages otherwise unknown to the individual, having superhuman strength, having elevated perception, the knowledge about things that a person should not otherwise know. You know, the devil does not know the future. The only one who knows the future is God himself. But again, the devil is very, very smart. He can use deductive reasoning, speculating what we might be thinking or how we might act, and then even try to present that as something factual. And then the fourth sign is a strong negative reaction to anything of a sacred nature, such as being shown the crucifix, being blessed with holy water, having a relic placed on your head while the priest is praying, um, and so on. So anything of a sacred nature that causes a negative reaction could be the sign of the presence of a demon. There can also be visible signs. There can be eyes rolled in the back of the head, foaming at the mouth. There can be bodily contortions. In my 16 years as an exorcist, I think I've seen about just about everything you can think of. I've seen people levitate when the demon manifests. I've seen somebody one time where their jaw dropped down and moved off to the side. They begin howling and snarling, throwing out all kinds of obscenities. 
the temperature in the room can drop. There can be very foul odors when a demon is present. It's always interesting that when demons manifest, it's always animalistic in nature. And it makes me think about the story of creation. On the sixth day of creation, God created animals and God created humans. And what separates humans from animals? The seventh day the day to honor and glorify God. And so when we choose to honor and glorify God, we complete our creation, just like the good angels did. But when we reject God, you could say that we're stuck on the sixth day, just like animals, if you will. So there is that notion. And whenever we think of the devil, what number comes to mind? 666. Six is considered the imperfect number, but seven is considered the perfect number. And why is seven the perfect number? Because it represents all that is. The three persons of the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the four elements of creation, earth, wind, fire, and water. So you put together God along with creation, the elements of creation, the number seven is the perfect number. Six is the imperfect number. Whenever I work with someone, I always try to determine what was the entry point. And in my years as an exorcist, there are uh, some primary ways that I see that people open up an entry point to the demons. And I'll share some of these with you, and then we're going to ask questions. So number one, again, there's many ways. These are the eight main ways that I've seen over the years, ties to the occult. The word occult comes from the Latin word occultus, meaning hidden or secret. It focuses on the paranormal. Its basic root is that people want a glimpse into the future. It's associated with things such as palm reading, medians, Ouija boards, tarot cards, psychics, pendulums, magic, horoscopes, knocking on wood and witchcraft. Now, I mentioned knocking on wood just to get your attention. Anybody here ever knock on wood? Most of us probably knock on plastic more than wood. But I use that as an example of how things of an occult nature can become so mainstreamed that we don't even think about what we're doing. So where does the practice of knocking on wood come from? It's a druid practice. It's the belief that spirits live in the trees. So you're knocking on the wood, asking the spirit that lives in the wood to come to your aid and to grant what you're asking. Now, if you've ever done that, I don't think you're possessed. So don't worry and think, oh my goodness, where's your number and can I get you on speed dial? No, I give that as an example of how things of the occult can become mainstreamed and we really just need to give some serious thought about what we do. So all these practices are condemned for they're a form of idolatry that violates the first commandment. And what is the first commandment? Nothing must ever take the place of God. And again, when we turn to things of the occult, we're looking for a substitute for God. You know, the Israelites made a golden calf, and the question would be, do people still do that today? But any time we look for a substitute for God, where does that leave us? In the bad place. Another entry point I call the entertainment industry. Movies, TV shows, literature, games, computer, and IT gadgets. So children today are growing up in front of a screen that's leaving them in isolation and not community. When did the serpent go after Adam and Eve when they were together? No, when they were apart. Their strength in numbers. How many times have you heard someone today say, I'm spiritual, but I don't need to go to church? They're failing to acknowledge the important role that other people play in our lives and that we play, to, that we play in each other's lives. So community is important. I like to watch Animal Planet shows when the lion is stalking its prey, who will it go after? The young, the weak. It will even go after the strong. If the strong does what? Leaves the safety of the herd. So again, 
When we are not together in community, we can get ourselves into trouble. And I think a lot of things in the entertainment industry today are uh, leading people into isolation. Another entry point would be a curse, the opposite of a blessing. It's doing harm to someone else with the help of the devil or a demon. Curses are only effective if we are weak in our faith. We cannot control what another person does, but we can make sure that we are spiritually strong. And how do we be spiritually strong? As Catholics, if you're going to Mass, if you're praying, if you're reading the Bible, the devil's already on the run. But again, when we move away from these spiritual practices that help to build up our defenses, we can get ourselves into trouble. St. Paul, in his letter to the Ephesians, talks about putting on the armor of Christ. We can read in Psalm 91, I need not fear the terror of the night nor the arrow that flies by day. Again, we know that God is there to protect us. You know, in, in 1 Peter, your opponent, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion, seeking one to devour. Resist him solid in your faith. The letter of James, chapter 4, verse 7, resist the devil and he will flee from you. You know, when the lion is tracking its prey, eventually it's going to give up if its prey is putting forth too much effort to get away because the lion knows, you know what? There's a lot easier prey out there. I'm going to let this one go. Don't be the easy prey for the devil. And again, we do that by living out our faith. And again, if we're living it out, a curse will have no impact on us whatsoever. A couple years ago, I did an exorcism in a Yupik Eskimo village in Alaska at the request of the Bishop of Fairbanks, Alaska. So he had already evaluated this person as being possessed, said he didn't have an exorcist. He asked me if I would do it. At the time, I was training the new exorcist in Anchorage. So we, threw, we flew 300 miles west of Anchorage out in the middle of nowhere, Alaska. What's interesting about the town that we were in, it's in the Yupik Eskimo language, but the name of the town means the place where it comes out. Now, it was in a reference to a river, but I couldn't help but notice the play on words, the place where it comes out. So the family traveled up river by two hours. We were in the little Catholic church in this village. Uh, we went into the chapel to do the exorcism. Exorcisms are always done in a sacred space. Never, you know, I jokingly say never in an abandoned house on a dead-end street at midnight during a thunderstorm. <laughs> That's a great movie, but not reality. The devil does not get to choose where he will be defeated. The church herself will make that determination. So we are in the chapel. The demon begins to manifest. Takes five people to hold the demon down. Once the, manifest, the manifestations begin, I'm saying the prayers of the church. I hold up my crucifix, and the demon looks at me and goes, your God is dead. Continued to pray. The demon howled. The person who was being exercised, their sister was in the room, got so terrified, ran out of the room. I was leaving the priest I was training. I said, well, you can take it from here. I think he looked behind him to see if there was someone else there. And then I went to talk to the sister who left. She is shaking out in the vestibule. And she says, I can't go back in there because I see so many demons. Once I ran out and looked back, she goes, I am terrified to be in there. So we prayed for about two hours. At one point, the heat came on, even though it was the summer, got cold. The whole building started to rattle and shake from the wall radiators. And by this time, I think the priest, the other priest was ready to hit the ceiling. So we prayed for about two hours. And then uh, every exorcism provides some relief, even if it doesn't provide total deliverance. So we were only going to be in the village for two days. So we were able to confirm the demonic possession identify demons, and then I was able to place the person under the care of the new exorcist of the Archdiocese of Anchorage. 
who continues to work with that person to this day. Another entry point is being dedicated to a demon, which seems pretty far-fetched, but the church says that no one under the age of reason can bring upon demonic activity themselves. The age of reason is the age of seven, which is why a child makes his or her first confession and first communion at the age of seven. So if somebody is dealing with the demonic under the age of reason, then they must have been dedicated to a demon by a parent or someone who had authority over them. One of the exorcisms in Rome was a young lady who told me that when she was born, her mother dedicated her to Satan because her mother blamed God for giving her a child that she did not want. So the daughter was exposed to satanic practices and rituals for the first 12 years of her life. She then ran away from home, ended up on the streets of Rome, and after about eight years or so, she found her way to Father Carmine, the priest who was training me, who then began doing exorcism prayers over her. The good news is, she's now a nun. So she knew what it was like to live on the streets, and then she dedicated her life to working with street children in the city of Rome. It's a great story because it lets us know that just because somebody was under the influence of the devil does not mean that they're lost forever. And just because somebody's possessed doesn't mean that they're manifesting evil all the time. It just means that there's a relationship between that person and the devil or some evil spirit, and something will trigger the demonic presence. Another entry point is abuse, which creates emotional wounds that can cause a person to seek help from the wrong sources. You know, as an exorcist, I hear horrific stories all the time. You deal with people that are on the fringes, so to speak. So I worked with somebody here in the city of Indianapolis who said that uh, they were dealing with the demonic because at the age of seven, growing up in another country, their father began to rape them at the age of seven. It went on for a five-year period until her dad turned his attention to her younger sister. She said at the age of 12, and she fell away from the church, began going to see psychics and medians, people who claimed that they could help her. But all she ended up doing was being broken even more and more and more. She's telling me the story, and she says, can you help me? And I looked at her and said, Jesus is going to help you. And as soon as I said that, her eyes turned green, her pupils became slanted, and this voice comes out and says, who's he? He has no power over us. The other priest that was with me immediately knelt and started saying Hail Marys. Her friend that had brought her to talk to me literally jumped over the table to get away. And then I walked right over and I put my hand on the person's head and this demon is looking at me, growling and snarling, foaming at the mouth, throwing out all kinds of obscenities towards me. I pray, I reach into my pocket, take out holy water to bless. You would have thought that I had thrown hot scalding water. There's a scream and a shriek. The demon collapses to the ground and then I end the session, and then a week later I scheduled to do an official exorcism. The archbishops of Indianapolis have always given me permission that if I believe an exorcism needs to be done, then I don't need their explicit permission. They say if you, need it, if you believe it needs to be done, then go ahead and do it. A week later we were in a chapel, and a person sitting in a chair, there's the other priest, the friend. We begin praying, and as soon as we begin praying, there's the green eyes again, the slanted pupils, and then the demon is mocking and laughing at me and says that you will never be cast out. And then we prayed for only 45 minutes. One of the parts of the, the ritual is the insufflation prayer. It's the breathing on of the Holy Spirit. Jesus breathed on his disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit. So in the rite of exorcism, the exorcist will breathe on the face of the one who is possessed, invoking the Holy Spirit, because wherever the Holy Spirit is present, an unclean spirit cannot remain. 
and then I just breathed on the face of the person, you'd have thought that they were hit by a, hur hur a hurricane force wind. The chair flew back 10 feet, hit the wall. There was a shriek and a scream. The person flew up out of the chair, landed on the floor. Myself and the other priests picked the person up. They're beaming as bright as the sun, and all the presence of the demonic is gone. And my experience as an exorcist is when a demon is cast out, you always hear the shriek or a scream. Another entry point would be a life of habitual sin. There's a lot of addictive behavior in the world today, alcohol, drugs, pornography. The danger is that people lose the sense of sin. We all know that we're sinners, but what does God want us to do? Repent, 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 repent. Because if we repent and say to God we're sorry, God will always forgive us. But if we can no longer call sin a sin, that's when we get ourselves into trouble. I always wonder what would have happened in the Garden of Eden when God went to Adam and said, what have you done? What did Adam do? The woman you placed here. Can't even call her Eve anymore. That woman you placed here. Pass in the buck. Eve, what have you done? That serpent over there. What would have happened when God said to Adam, Adam, what have you done? If Adam would have said, I sinned and I'm sorry to take ownership of our actions. That's all that's required because we know in John's gospel, God is love. And if we're sincere, then God will always give us his love. Think of the good thief on the cross. We don't even know what he did wrong, but Jesus says, this day you'll be with me in paradise. We look at a crucifix Jesus is saying he loves us this much. We think about his sacred heart, again, the symbol of love. And if we can repent, just call sin a sin, God is always ready to forgive. That's why the sacrament of reconciliation is so important. Another entry point is inviting a demon into our lives. I did an exorcism where somebody believed that a friend of theirs was possessed. They said to their friend, what's ever in you, I invite to come in to me. No sooner did the words come out, misguided notion of charity, felt something come over them. In working with the person, seven demons identify themselves in this person. Oftentimes when someone is possessed, it's not just one demon, but a cluster of demons. And there's always one of a higher rank. The weakest demons are always the first to go. The one demon that refused to go told me its name was Leviathan. It's a demon mentioned in the Bible. It told me it did not have to leave because it had been invited in, and since it had been invited in, it was making a legal claim on the life of this person. But again, in an exorcism, we can say that a demon is commanded to return that which it has stolen, namely a person created in the image and likeness of God, because this person is now rejecting whatever they did. So again, we can change we can grow in holiness and virtue. The devil would have us believe, strike one and you're out. But remember, Jesus says not seven times, but 77 times. So we can always make a return to the Lord. When this demon was cast out, worked with the person for a year, commanded the demon to say, Hail Mary, full of grace, and to leave immediately. The demon looked at me and laughed and goes, Grace of full. And then I told the demon to obey me in all things, although an unworthy minister of Christ, to say the words in the order that I told it to say it, and in the name of Jesus Christ, to leave immediately. And this demon that had been speaking in this deep, authoritative voice looked at me and in a child's voice goes, Hail Mary, full of grace. There was a shriek. And every manifestation of evil was gone quicker than you could snap your fingers. And then the final entry point, broken relationships. We all deal with brokenness in our lives, but how we deal with it does seem to matter. When we have brokenness, do we give in to anger and bitterness and resentment and the like? Those are the very things that the devil feeds on. But whenever we deal with brokenness in our lives, we should always try to heal that. The best example comes from the Bible itself. 
chapter 5 of Mark's Gospel, the story of the Gerasen demoniac, the man possessed by legion. He's living in the tombs. Shackles won't even hold him. There's superhuman strength. The demons recognize Jesus. We know who you are, the Holy One of God. Jesus rebukes them. They ask to be sent into the swine. They're going to the swine. They race over the hillside. They drown in the lake. The man who's now free of legion, something very powerful happens. Most people usually stop reading this story. But the man who's now free of legion wants to follow Jesus down the road. And Jesus says to him, no. How often does Jesus tell somebody not to follow him? So the lights should be gone off. They should be flashing. Jesus says to him, go home to your family. So a man who was living amongst the dead is now placed back amongst the living. And again, healthy relationships, community is so important. So is there a way out of all this mess? And the answer is yes. The solution rests with each and every one of us. You know, as people of faith, we can set the good example. We can help people break the vicious cycle of evil and to help people enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ. Demons have power. They can only be, be defeated by power. The power that defeats them is the power of God, and the right of exorcism is the means for calling God forth. And with that said, I probably went over already. Any questions that you have, I'd be happy to entertain them at this time. Yes? Have I ever encountered the same demon more than once? I have not, but I've had an exorcist friend of mine who has also encountered the demon Leviathan. And it was about three years after I cast him out that he encountered the same demon. People always ask, where do demons go when they're cast out? Well, God makes that determination. Sometimes you'll hear people say, go to the foot of the cross and let Jesus deal with you as he will. But we know that demons will have the ability to roam on this earth until the final judgment. So in an exorcism, the relationship between that person and the demon is broken, but the demon is not banished to hell. The demon is not destroyed. It's just that that connection is broken. Yes? So the question is, if somebody is possessed, the demon at times can be hidden and not manifesting, and why is the case? So demons actually don't want to really be known, because if they're known, then the battle against them can begin if they reveal themselves. So somebody has done something that's created the relationship, and then there's something that could cause the manifestation. Usually the manifestation may occur because the person is trying to enter into holiness and virtue. Just because somebody is possessed doesn't mean it's 100% of them. Something that the person always remains free, and the part that remains free can ask for the help of the church. And if the demon knows the person is now wanting to break that relationship, then it can cause these manifestations to afflict the person, to cause pain, as a way for the person to say, I don't want this pain, therefore I'll just live in a harmonious relationship with this demon. There is something known as perfect possession, whereby somebody reaches the point that they are in a harmonious relationship with the demon, that there are actually no longer any manifestations. Because the manifestations means the demons are being tormented, and they don't like the torment. Even the right of the church has meant the demon the things that the church does is meant to cause the demon to manifest because only when it manifests does the battle against it begin. And again, the things that the church is using to defeat the demon are the very core aspects of our faith. You know, the word of God, for example, the sacramental life of the church. Think of sacramentals. You know, an exorcism is also a sacramental, but the use of holy water, the relics, the Bible, 
those types of things. So it's throwing into the face of the demon the things that it has rejected. So the question is, do demons ever try to physically harm me or anyone else in the room or even the person possessed? They, they could. The, the very opening prayer of the rite is asking God to protect and safeguard everyone involved in the exorcism of the church. I prepare myself by going to confession, spending time in prayer. I will celebrate Mass. So again, you know, the church says that when a priest... He acts, you know, in the person of Christ. Even if the priest is quirky, if he does a, if he celebrates Mass, it's still the body and blood of Christ. If he does a wedding, the people are still married, a baptism, they're still baptized. That's not true in an exorcism. The personal character of the exorcist does matter. And so if there's a connection with evil or sin in my life, then I've given the demon a hook, if you will, on why it doesn't have to leave. And my experience is that during an exorcism, when a demon manifests, it will try to look around the room to determine who's the weakest link. There's no such thing as exorcism tourism. People don't come just out of a sense of curiosity. The church does not record exorcisms to protect the identity of the people involved. You know, people will say, well, why don't you record them? You know, that would be proof. Well, we don't record confessions either and then post them on social media. Again, you protect the identity of the person. If the individual later wants to go on and share their story, that's up to them. You know, the young man who in 1949 was the source of the movie The Exorcist, you know, he just died last year at the age of 85. He never spoke about it even though people constantly approached him from the media, threw millions of dollars at him, he always said, no, we're not talking about this anymore. That's, I think there's a new documentary that just came out on the uh, History Channel, The Exorcism of Roland Doe, and that's about this man. Of course, in the movie, it was a young girl, but again, the 1949 case of the young boy from... Uh, Mount Rainier, Maryland, who had an exorcism in St. Louis by permission of Cardinal Ritter. So there's always that connection, even with Indianapolis. Any other questions? Someone who hasn't asked one? Yes. So what percentage of the callers do I get are genuine, demonic? It's hard to say because I really need to evaluate somebody. And, you know, I, a couple years ago, I, I got a, a call from the Central African Republic. And then I got a letter in French from the person asking for help from Zimbabwe. I've gotten calls from Norway, Hong Kong, Canada, Argentina, all over the place. I, 2017, I spent 14 days in South Africa with a colleague from Chicago. Uh, we went there to give some talks to the bishops of South Africa and then to train priests and to do exorcisms in South Africa. So without really being able to evaluate the person, it's hard to say. That's why if somebody contacts me, I don't really want to weigh in on whether I believe it's valid or not or credible or not credible. I would rather direct them to someone in their area. Who's the number one person that per a person should see if they think they're dealing with the demonic? Their parish priest. Their parish priest. You, you think for a moment if you're sick, you have a headache, do you call a neurologist to schedule brain surgery right away? No. You go to see your family doctor who then helps you sort out what is taking place in your life. And then if it needs to be referred to an expert then they're the ones to do that. And it's so important for the parish priest to be involved because the person is going to need ongoing pastoral care. 
and I can't take under my care everybody that I work with and see, but it's going to be the local parish. And then for people who are not Catholic from another Christian faith tradition, then the pastor of their church, people that are coming from other world religions or no faith background, those present additional challenges. But again, the church recognizes that exorcism is a ministry of charity. So the church will always want to respond. Many people that call me from other areas, I had somebody call me today from California, and they're like, you know, I reached out in my area, people don't return phone calls, they hang up on me, they don't respond to emails. That's the worst thing that can be done, just to ignore people. You know, I try to respond to everyone who contacts me or my assistant or in some form or another. Now, that doesn't mean that people don't get mad at me. Because again, if most people have self-diagnosed, if they believe that they're possessed, and then they're demanding an exorcism, and they're like, and I'm like, well, there's the process. And they're like, I don't care about your process. This is what I need. But again, it's not my process. It's the church. If you're relying on me, we're back to what I said earlier, all in trouble. But again, I have to follow the protocols and the procedures of the church. People don't want to do that, then that's really up to them. And I have to tell people what I believe based on my own understanding. You know, I can't just tell somebody what they want to hear. I believe the church would be doing greater harm if it gives the label to someone as being possessed, if that label prevents the person from getting the true help that they need, either from the mental health profession or from their medical doctor. I always believe that the priest, the psychiatrist, and the medical doctor should work together trying to determine is this spiritual, mental, or physical. But again, there should be that collaboration that is taking place. The last question, I see we're ready to go off live stream in a minute. Yes. Yes. Let there be light. They weren't in heaven yet. They weren't, again, they're, they're created. Now you're asking a, a question, where were they? They're pure spirits, so they don't have body as we would have them. So God created them, but it's all happening quicker than this. You have to remember there's no time and there's no time. No time is God's gift to us. God does not exist in time. Demons do not exist in time and space as we understand it. How do, how do angelic creatures move, whether they're good or bad? Thought process. You just think it, you're there. You think it, you're there. That's why we would say demons are neither here nor there. We say they're here or there if they're choosing to act there, which again, in my role would be, if this is something demonic, why is it acting there? Especially when it comes to demonic infestation. Demons do not have an address. They don't have a residence. You know, when people go to these haunted houses and all of that, it's not that the demon lives there. Oftentimes, it's the very things that people are doing that's attracting the attention of the demons, which are causing them to manifest. But they're neither here nor there. So God created the, the angelic world. If we go back to St. Augustine, let there be light. It's the angelic world. God then says, okay, infuse knowledge evening knowledge. Will you now use that to glorify me and complete your creation? And then Lucifer in one-third said, no thank you. And then the re in book of Revelation says they were cast down to the earth. So it's all happening. But he says, we don't know when the angelic world was actually created. But again, relying on St. Augustine, he just says at the very beginning when God says, let there be light. Because again, when we think of light, we think of illumination, you know, enlightened creatures. But then that light was separated into day and darkness. And then he's, that's when he says, good angels, and then the bad angels. And that's just a theological opinion, certainly not anything that the church says that this is a part of our deposit of faith. Oftentimes we can't explain many things. How does the bread and wine become the body and blood of Christ at Mass? We don't know. That's why it's the mystery of faith. 
How did he become? Don't know. Jesus said it. Therefore, good enough for me. It's a mystery. St. Augustine even said when you're studying theology, and at the, the very first moment you say, ah, I now understand God, he says, then what you have comprehended is not God because the human mind cannot wrap itself around God because a creature cannot understand the creator in God's totality. We can know something of God, certainly from the person of Christ, but whatever we know is smaller than that. That's why it's relying on faith. The Lord be with you. I'm going to read you a prayer. It's the year of St. Joseph. So the appropriate prayer is St. Joseph, terror of demons. St. Joseph, terror of demons, cast your solemn gaze upon the devil and all his minions and protect us with your mighty staff. You fled through the night to avoid the devil's wicked designs. Now with the power of God, smite the demons as they flee from you. Grant special protection, we pray, for children, fathers, families, and the dying. By God's grace, no demon dares approach while you are near. So we beg of you, always be near to us. Amen. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. I'll leave the night light on. No, just... <laughs> Let's give one last final round of applause. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you for everybody who joined us this evening. For those who joined us on the live stream, that concludes our night with the exorcist. Have a good night, everybody.